Hey, good morning, beloved. Thank you once again for joining us this morning in Sunday Fellowship. It is a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Uh, okay, the neighborhood. Not the depression. Not, not that hood. Not, not victimhood. The neighborhood. Yeah, here in Sunnyvale. Anyway, glad you guys could join us this morning. We are going to, uh, I'm pretty sure this is going to take a couple of weeks because uh, there are two processes we're going to take a look at today. And so, uh, uh, well, there's two processes I want us to look at, the process of sonship and the process of desensitization to the mystery of sonship. And so uh, instead of trying to pack it all together and get it all done today, I will trust the Father to give you what we need today and conclude it, uh, Lord willing, next week. But anyway, we are going to <clears throat> go into this with an understanding that the mystery of sonship or the message of sonship is, is not known. Uh, it's not really known by a lot of the body of Christ today. Just like back in the day when we used to be in the uh, In Christ message, uh, uh, the, 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 the In Christ position, uh, when I used to be a part of Christ Life Fellowship as a body, I, we used to have Christ Life Fellowship wherever we were. We were Christ Life Fellowship of Minot, North Dakota. We were Christ Life Fellowship of Wiesbaden, Wiesbaden, Germany. We were Christ Life Fellowship. Wherever we were, we were Christ Life Fellowship. But the message of our identity in Christ, as many things as the Father has done through the centuries, is really not known. And there's an issue with that. The, there's an issue with Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's an issue with uh, the, the spiritual birth identity that we have in Christ as the Son of God to God the Father. Remember, spiritual sonship or spiritual identity has to do with who we are to him, not necessarily who we are to one another. That should be common. It, unfortunately, in the church today, we seem to have more common identity with who we are to one another as Baptists or Methodists or in Christ believers or all the titles and identities we've accumulated with that, with that knowledge uh, to who we are to one another. But the, that's not the issue. The issue is who we are to God as the Father who birthed us to him, and then through that we really have an identity with those in the family, uh, the, the, those brothers and sisters in the family, or those sons in the family. So we're going to just take a, 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 a few minutes today and go over some of those things that uh, you might have heard before. Uh, I'm not too much wrapped around the axle that I can't say something again and again. Yeah, I was telling dear brother yesterday that uh, if you read Paul's epistles, what he said to the Col what he said to the Colossians, the Ephesians, and the Galatians, sometimes was the same identical words. So I'm not opposed to saying what the Father gives me to say and, 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 and say it again. Because I understand how people think. Most of us live in distraction. <laughs> Most of us live with distractions. And those distractions come from some place that wants to hinder you and I from coming to the fullness of the mystery of our spiritual identity in Christ as the Son of God to him. Uh, not so much as who we are to each other, because it, when we learn who we are to our Father, who we are to one another will be a lot easier to understand, a lot easier to know who we are to each other in love. So with that said, we're going to get started with uh, Catherine reading the, the intro here. What's the issue with the mystery of sonship? Answer, it's still a mystery. 2 Corinthians 11, 3. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craft, so your thoughts should be corrupted from simplicity as to the Christ. What is the issue with the message and revelation of sonship? The answer is that it is spiritual. Thus, it is a mystery that must be revealed by God, who is the spiritual father of each son he has spiritually birthed to himself. Far too many in religion speak of a salvation, which has a foundation that rests on a belief system or a set of beliefs which are embraced by men as the right way to enter a relationship with God or Jesus. To them there can be no other salvation but theirs. 
You have become one of them. They add your identity to their belief system, and you are a new person. You have joined them and entered a new walk of life or way of living. Or maybe you have received and been joined with Christ, and now you and Christ, or you and Jesus, walk together forever. You're constantly taught and encouraged to let him be uh, him in you and through you. And with his help, you will be victorious because he now lives in you. And that is all you need to have victory in this life, in this world. Maybe they use the term born again or saved or have a changed life. But no matter what the term is used, you never stop being you, biological flesh identity with Christ or with Jesus or with God added to you, the ongoing union of two identities. So why does this idea of two identities continue? There are two processes we need to talk about. Okay. We've, we've, we've uh, had more than one message on, on this parts of this subject. Uh, Curtis has done a job uh, uh, sharing with us what the Father's given him on the two-person gospel. Uh, the, the, he did one, I think, in 2019, the, the two identities. Uh, I can't remember the first part of it. I looked at it la- yesterday. Uh, but he's got several messages on the two identities, uh, two lives, two, two, two-person gospel. Now, that, uh, let, let, let me interject something with this. Because I don't want you to be deceived. And, and I, don't, I don't want you to be confused. You might be confused anyway, but I don't want you to be confused with this understanding of the two-person gospel. Now, that's the revelation that the Father gave to, to, to as a matter of fact, it came through Curtis. Uh, he used the term first, two-person gospel. I didn't use that term uh, because it's from our Father. I received that word, and it's, it's, it's fixed in my mind. And let me tell you what, what it means to me. Now you, got, you got to listen to Curtis if you want to know what Curtis says about this. But any gospel or any doctrine or teaching that adds you and Christ together and you stay you, that's two people. That's Jesus and you. There's no oneness in that. So when Jesus said, my father and I are one, he didn't mean there was two in the sense that there's two of them. He meant we're the same. We're the same person. We have the same character. We have the same nature. We have the same essence, as my brother would say. So I don't want you to be confused because every, every part of religion always has to have you available so they can count you in their baptisms. They can count you in their Sunday school classes. They can count you and make you a part of that idea or that identity as a Baptist, as a Catholic, as a Methodist, as a non-denominational Pentecostal or charismatic. They, have, they need you. They need your biological box identity to make their gospel relevant to the world in their mind. So there will always be this two-person gospel until the, the harpazo or the rapture takes place into that time when, when uh, God will be dealing with nations again. But there will always be a two-person gospel. It, it will be there. But we're not advocating a two-person gospel. We're advocating two that become one that brings forth a new identity. A, a sperm and an ovum or two. They are joined, but they are still two until a process within that ovum takes place that brings all the identity of the sperm and the egg into one new person called a baby or a child. So we're not advocating two. We're advocating there's only one, and we are one new creation in Christ by spiritual birth. So I don't walk around with Christ <clears throat> and me. Let me say it again. I don't walk around with Christ and me because that would mean he has his own thing, I have my own thing, and I just try to get together with him periodically to find out what he wants to do through me or what he wants to be in me. 
and all of that, that's all, that's, that's, that, I mean, that's fine. But the Bible says, Father, Jesus said, Father, in John 17, I think John 17, 21, 22, Father, I pray that they be one with us as I am one with you. So is that a group thing? Or is Jesus saying something we don't understand spiritually? So this is what I mean when we say, what is the issue with the mystery of sonship? The issue is we've been bombarded by the enemy through religion, and through politics, that, that there is no mystery. Sonship is just part of religion. Sonship is not an entity within itself. It's not a God idea. And so uh, we're going to take just a little entry into that today and trust the Father to finish it up next week. So let's, let me let Catherine read on here so we can get into this next part. The desensitization to the mystery of sonship. The most powerful and loving God idea is spiritual sonship. It was established in the heart of the Father before the foundation of the world. Because it was before creation, there is nothing in creation that can stop it from taking place within every human being. <clears throat> Sadly, many believe that Satan can stop spiritual birth, which is the foundation of spiritual sonship. He can't stop anyone from receiving what was established and provided before he and humankind were created. Let me, let me pause with that. Think about that for just one second. He cannot stop something that God did before he and humans were created. He can't stop spiritual birth. He can't stop the birthing. That's a good thing. That's a good, that's a good because it's spiritual. So he cannot stop it because it took place before he was created, but even before we were created. So what God put in motion at creation didn't start at creation. It started before then. And it manifests itself right now through creation or through time. So Satan can't stop the birthing, but he can stop and affect something else. Let's continue to read. But he can attack anyone and everyone from learning who they are in Christ as the spiritually birthed son of God. Let me say that again. He can stop and impact anyone and everyone from learning who they are in Christ as the spiritually birthed son of God. Man, I, it, I, it, I, I, it, at this very moment, my heart and my mind and my spirit cries out for the body of Christ today. There are many sitting in buildings this morning. There's many sitting in rooms today and even yesterday, because yesterday some yesterday was the Sabbath in, 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 in the law, under the law, and there's believers who meet on, 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 on Saturdays, uh, Seventh-day Adventists. A lot of those brothers and sisters were born and birthed by God. But because of that, that's a distraction. Satan distracts you if you're following anything that denies spiritual birth has made you another person spiritually to the Father. And, and, and you, men cannot grasp. Men do not want to receive. They continually reject the idea that, that the answer, and I'm going to step on some toes, okay? Just pray for me. I'm about to step on some toes. Jimmy, pray for me, Okay. The answer is not the book. The answer is the word of God, which is a person. The answer is the word. So I'm trusting that as we move on into this dispensation of sonship, I get pushed back on that periodically, the dispensation of sonship, and what I mean by that, some of you have been with us for a while and you should know this, the dispensation of grace is the dispensation of sonship. Why? Because it's the only time between the cross and the rapture men have the opportunity to become spiritually birthed by God. There is no other time. 
There was no time before the cross. There would be no time after the rapture that men would be able to be born of God, spiritually born of God. This is the time that God is birthing his own children spiritually, his own sons as a family, but the son to him, each child, each spiritually birthed person that you are is the son of God, is the son of God. So we're in the dispensation of sonship. This is what God is doing. This is what God is the father. Do. This has been his heart's desire before the foundation of the world. You have something that nobody has ever known before in the history of mankind, that you're the spiritually birthed son of God, and to him, you're the son, neither male nor female. So those of you who are stuck with the idea that's daughters of God, you, you females that's, uh, that's still stuck with the daughters of God, that's not true. There's neither male nor female. I'm not a son because I'm, I'm an X, Y. Chromosome. I'm not a son because I'm an ex-wife. I'm a son because I'm spiritually raised by God. And to him, David, you are the son of God. He didn't say you're the son because you're a man or a male. You're the son because you're spiritually birthed to the father. And he makes you who you are to him as the son. That's male and female. Okay. Please, Catherine, continue. But he can attack anyone and everyone from learning who they are in Christ as the spiritually birthed son of God. He at his attacks are calculated and go all the way back to God's first adopted son, Adam, <laughs> and it has continued to God's spiritually birthed sons today. Satan's attack is a process of desensitization to spiritual identity of everyone who has received and believed in Christ. The foundation and cornerstone of this attack is fear. What fear? The fear of becoming another person equal with Jesus, Father, Father's firstborn son. So, what does this process look like? His, Satan's fear of our opportunity to become someone he cannot is where he starts his attack. His attack, he attacks the minds of humankind with fear. The process starts with an illusion. Fear produces an illusion about identity. Once someone buys into the illusion of their identity in the flesh, they are deceived. The identity of the flesh is temporary. It has a time stamp and an expiration date. Those who have bought into the big lie of an ongoing identity of me and the flesh are not only deceived, but will become held into captivity of their temporary outer identity. 2 Corinthians 11, 3, 14 through 15. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity, spiritual identity that is in Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. 1 Timothy 2.14, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived, fell into transgression. Let me, let me interject something in that for just one second. That verse says, Adam was not deceived. You should understand. He was not tricked. He was not brought into some kind of misunderstanding. So when Paul is saying here, Adam was not deceived, but the woman. We all know we've been, in, it's, those of you who've been with us for a while, we know that uh, the woman in this as Paul is talking about in, 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 in uh, Genesis chapter 3, was Eve. In Genesis chapter 2, uh, Adam said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. When God presented this woman to him, he said, you shall be called woman for, because you were taken from man. So Adam identified her. Somebody asked me recently at breakfast, did, did he see spiritually? He did not. He saw his flesh. He identified it. He matter of fact, he did. If you go back in chapter 2, it says that God brought the animal for <laughs> God brought the animals before Adam to see what he would call them. That tells us something, but I won't go into it. We've discussed this before, but to see what he would call them. And if that verse says, and whatever Adam named them, that's the name that they had. 
Well, when God presented all the animals to Adam, he gave them names, and that's the name they were. He then later on, I think in verse 16, brought this woman to him that he had took, taken from Adam, and he said, this is when God presented this, this, this person, this new person to him, he said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You shall be called woman. He understood who she was that was his flesh. So we get to chapter 3 uh, when we see the uh, uh, Satan attacking. He didn't attack Adam's knowledge. He attacked his flesh. And believe it or not, it's the same way today. Your identity your flesh identity is attacked all the time. You, you're under attack because of who you are in your flesh. And the more you cling to that identity, the greater the attack, the more the distractions. He'll keep you in your past. He'll keep you fearful of the future. He'll keep you circling the wagons about the things that's going on around you in your flesh. He, his attack is on your flesh identity, the part of you that is deceived, the part of you that can be, I'm sorry, that can be deceived. Why is that hard to understand? Because we have not yet come to a place to rest in spiritual identity. We haven't come to a place to rest in it. When stuff happens, we raise up against it in the flesh. We raise up against it in the identity that's really not who we are, the one that's passing away. Do you know every day you walk around with your own coffin? You take this coffin, this box, <laughs> this box life identity is a coffin. You just take your coffin with you every day. Coffin. You take it around with you every day. You take the clay pot. And it becomes something to you. And because it's something to you, I'm not saying you don't have feelings, you don't have emotions, you don't have those things that built into the soul mind. But the problem is your body and soul was one all of your life, and that's what you know. That's where his attack is. Curtis once said, uh, uh, Satan imitates everything God does. And he imitates. The imitation is that you are who you are in your biological identity. And distractions and attacks in the past. No wonder Paul said, putting those things behind. I count all things lost. I, 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 there's a depth to that verse. There's a depth to Philippians chapter 3 that I don't see many of us have come to. So desensitization to spiritual identity or the mystery of sonship is what Satan is attacking. He's attacking that mystery that the Father has done when we are born again, when we're birthed from above, he's attacking that in your mind. He's deceiving believers. He's deceiving every one of us who think we got it in control. I'm smarter than you. So I'm smarter than most people don't even think about it. But we're saying we're smarter than God and the devil. You're not. You're not. Yes, we're born with the mind of the son. We're born again. Technically, we were born with the mind of our father, but because it's because he's given us, his, it becomes ours. So we have the mind of the son of God because we have the, the, the nature and character of our father. But I'm telling you once again, I'm sharing with you, I'm encouraging you, you got to let that go. <laughs> Curtis, let that go, brother. <laughs> we got to let that go. We got to let go of this idea that Satan's throwing up. He's throwing up these things that distract you and I on a daily basis. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen to me. I just don't respond like some of you. My response is different. My response is based on my knowledge of who I am as a son, period. But I'm telling you, the attack is the same. He doesn't know, Satan doesn't know anything else to do. He's angry with God. He's angry with you. He's angry with us more than he is with God. Because he's still trying to prove we're not worthy to be the son of God. 
We're not worthy to be the spiritual son of God. And so he distracts you and he distracts the church and he distracts believers and poor preachers who don't know anything else but what they grew up in. That's the same box. That's the same casket they're carrying around. So his attack is to desensitize everyone to, to hinder the renewing of their mind to spiritual identity as a son of God. Can't. That's what he does. That's all he knows how to do. And even that's limited to a certain extent. Because he can't kill us. But he can deceive you in the mind of your flesh, and you'll never live out the Son of God. You do like Adam. When God faced Adam about his disobedience, Adam said, the woman you gave me, she gave me to eat, and I did eat. Now, it's not written. I'm going I'm to add this. It's not written. God said, yeah, you're right. I gave it to you, but I told you not to eat. So why did you yield to your flesh? You did say she was born with your bone and flesh in your flesh, didn't you? Yes, sir, I did. So why did you yield to your flesh? Men are still doing that today. You, some of you might still be doing that today. What are you looking for? Anything that keeps you from being another person spiritually. Anything that keeps you from being another person spiritually. Your, your identity is fixed before the Father. The only person who's not fixed. Matter of fact, Satan even knows your identity is fixed. Most believers have no clue. Do you know that? So, let, I'm going to let Catherine free. That verse in 1 Timothy 2.14 uh, and Adam was not deceived. We can go back to that, Jim. And Adam was not deceived. But his flesh, being deceived, fell into transgression. Go ahead, Catherine, please. Titus 3.3, 3, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures. No, pause. We were once deceived. Serving various lusts and pleasures. Where? In the flesh. In the flesh. In an identity that's passing away. In an identity that no longer fits who we are spiritually. Living in malice and envy and hateful and uh, hating one another. Stop. Beloved, look at that. When you deceive, you are serving lusts and pleasures in the flesh. Envying in the flesh. Envy is FOMO, fear of missing out. <laughs> Hateful and hurting one another. Keep, keep going, baby. Thank you. The definition of one who is captive is held under control of another, but having the appearance of independence. Do you realize what that, what that means when you're in captivity? You're under the control of another, but having the appearance of independence. What is that under the control of, a, of another? Who, who is that another? Is that Satan? Would you say that's Satan, Catherine? Under control of another. Who's control? Who would you say that? Who would that be? Who would that other be than another? I think it's your flesh. Correct. Correct. You're held under control of your flesh, having the appearance of independence. I'm my own man. I'm my own woman. Let your emotions and fears just control every decision you make. Correct. Correct. When your past is your present, your present is your future. Keep going. Thank you. Romans 7, 23. But I see another law in my members. Oh, Paul, what are you talking about? Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. 
Ah, uh, Paul. Oh, but I remember Curtis told me he didn't like Romans 7. Couldn't wrap his mind around Romans 7. Romans 7 is tough on you, but it gives you a way of escape. It lets you know that your flesh is not your identity, but your flesh can take you captive. I see another law in my body, war against the law of my mind. So my mind and my body are two separate things, bringing me into captivity the law of sin, which is in my body, my biological identity can hinder my spiritual identity if I give it a mind. It's attacking my mind. The mind of the Son of God is under attack from the body, but that comes from the outside, too. That comes from the one that's the God of this world. But we'll get to that in a second. Keep going. Second Timothy 2.26, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Wow! Look at that. That, that, look at that. That they might recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken, he's talking about the ones above them, the ones who need recovering, who are taken captive by him, which is the devil, at his will. Now, how does he do that? He desensitizes us first that our spiritual birth is based on what somebody did to us. We were baptized, we went down the aisles at that church, or we uh, had a, uh, we, we went to a, a, a revival, uh, as one, <laughs> my brother say, a soul winning, uh, they went to a soul winning uh, service. You know, but we have these things that we go to that we attribute. I was baptized in the Baptist church, or as the Church of Christ said, uh, you, you baptize in their church, and if you're not, you're not saved. We got all these things that he's taken us captive at his will that pertains to our identity in the flesh. We are taken captive by him at his will. He has that much over your flesh. He has that impact on your identity and your flesh. Let's keep reading. Let's take a moment to think about that definition, held under control of another but having the appearance of independence. Second Peter 2.19, while they promised them liberty, they... Now, they being wherever you go and wherever you went, and you grew up a Catholic, they as Catholics. You grew up Baptist, they are Baptist. You grew up Presbyterian, they are Presbyterian. You grew up independent, they are independent Baptist. You grew up charismatic, they are charismatic. You grew up non-denominational, they are non-denominational. While they, whoever they are, wherever your flesh identity is tied to, that, that's the day, and they promise you freedom. They promise you liberty. Now, they being, them being you in your biological identity. You want to be free from sin? Just... Do this. You want, you want to stop drinking? Just do this. God can set you free of that. You just need to trust him and pray. Uh, through prayer and fasting. I don't have anything against prayer and fasting, but prayer and fasting is not the answer. It's a breakthrough, but that's a part of that that is spiritual that men don't see. Prayer and fasting can definitely be a work of the flesh. Let me say it again. Nothing against prayer and fasting. I, I, I do prayer and fasting periodically. My understanding might be a little different than yours. Uh, but prayer and fasting is spiritual. This is not a work of the flesh. It's not about you not eating. They themselves are the servants of corruption. What do you mean corruption? The flesh. Paul said, this corruption must put on incorruption, 1 Corinthians 15. What corruption are you talking about? The body you live in, your biological identity, servants of the flesh. I want you to think about that for a second. Most churches this meeting this morning, there are servants of corruption. 
They are trying to get people to change their behavior, behavior modification. They're trying to show people anything. I won't even go there. That's just keep reading, please. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. They are under the control of fear, seeking to keep or maintain a me and Christ identity. Sadly, very few ever live outside of their box life identity of Satan's two-person gospel. The last part of the process of desensitization to the mystery of spiritual sonship is delusional thinking. When someone enters the level of desensitization, the illusion is the truth and everything else is a lie. In the illusion, the, the final level of desensitization is when the person arrives at this level of desensitization, there is no truth. Everything else is a lie. There is no truth. Truth is subjective. I remember I said this before, and I don't mind saying it again. I heard old Rudy Giuliani say in 2019 on Fox News, the truth is not the truth. Now, he's ignorant, but in his heart and mind, He's saying the truth is what I say it is or what we say it is. So that means truth is subjective. It's not absolute. It has to be subjective because everybody thinks what they believe is the truth. So if there's no absolute truth, then you're in delusional thinking. Let's read that. Let's read that. When someone enters the level of desensitization, the illusion is the truth and everything else is a lie. There is no coronavirus. 500,000 people died from, over 500,000 people died from something else. We got all of this thing going around religiously and politically. Nothing is truth. There is no truth. Well, some will say, well, Jesus said I'm the truth. I'll wait on that. I'll wait on that one. Keep going. The definition of delusion says this, the act of tricking or deceiving someone, a persistent false psychotic belief regarding the self or persons or objects outside the self that is maintained despite indisputable evidence to the contrary. Despite, maintain, maintain a false belief that is maintained outside of self, in our case, it would be your true self-identity, your true identity, which is spiritual son, that is maintained despite indisputable evidence to the contrary. But you see, in a world where identity is, false identity is, 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 in a world where identity is laden, with truth being based on what I feel, what I think, and what I believe, or what somebody else tells me, then, put, put that back up for a minute, Jim, that definition. There is no indisputable evidence. Despite indisputable evidence, to the contrary. You see, if truth is not absolute, then there is no indisputable evidence because everybody's belief system is is truth. When you leave this world, you're going to be with the Lord. You're going to get there and you're going to see Mama and Daddy and and Uncle Bobby and Aunt Susie and Granny and all these other people because the indisputable Evidence is that you will be you no matter what. False psychotic, the word psychotic <laughs> is a medical term. It's a psychiatry term. Delusional thinking and psychotic thinking is the same. But a psychotic belief regarding yourself or persons. Think about that for just a second. A self that is maintained despite indisputable evidence to the contrary. 
If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He is a, another person spiritually. Old things, the old identity has passed away to him. All things have become new. That's not indisputable evidence. Can't be. Why? Because most human beings are deceived. And at this level, you bought into the lie. You bought into the big lie of the illusion. But anyway, go ahead, babe, please. Second Thessalonians 2, 9 through 11. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they, will, that they should believe the lie. At this level of thinking and desensitization, there is an illusion of explanatory depth with inconvincible confirmation bias. It is almost impossible to see anything outside of the power of this desensitization Satan uh, has over someone. John seven forty seven. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? The answer to that question is this. If you don't know, understand, and realize your spiritual identity as another person to God the Father, and yes, then yes, you are deceived. Paul tells us there is a way of escape, another process God as our Father has prepared for each of his spiritual sons. This process is called the process of spiritual sonship. This process is the revelation of the mystery of spiritual birth and the exchanged identity that took place at the very moment of spiritual birth. This work of the Holy Spirit in renewing of the mind to who we are in Christ as another person spiritually the spiritual son of God to the father. No man can give you this revelation and no man can take it away. Okay, thank you. I, I will conclude with the, the, pro, this, uh, the second process. This process that I'm going to give you next week is the process of spiritual sonship. That process took place, before God established that process before the foundation of the world. The process of desensitization came after or since the world began. So you got a process that was since the world began, and you got a process that, that, that is, is, is in play before the foundation of the world. One deals with spiritual identity. The other deals with box life. A biological identity. One comes after creation and one comes before creation. So we're going to talk about that a little bit next week. I want to give you a little of this up front. What I've, and I'm going to add this, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this, but there are four basic uh, kinds of identity. Now, from these four, there are other things that will outwork from them. And I put them as biological identity, which is both absolute and temporary. What I mean by absolute, everybody has their own DNA that makes it absolute, but it's also temporary. Then there's legal identity, which is temporary. In other words, I got my driver's license here, my military ID. When I walk into a place, I show them that. They say that. They look at my picture, and they say, okay, that's, that's you. Come on in. Take as much money out of the bank as you want. It's yours. You can take it. That identity is temporary. Legal identity is temporary. Uh, personal identity. Personal identity is both absolute and everlasting. Because personal identity is your personal identity in soul mind. Everyone has a unique identity that is in soul mind. The issue is when it's in, it, 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 it manifests, your personal identity is manifested by what you are one with or who you're one with. If you're one with the body, then your personal identity has to do with who you are in the flesh. If you're one in the, in the spirit, then your personal identity has to do with who you are spiritually. 
personal identity is both absolute, it cannot be changed, and it's everlasting. Now, I put the word everlasting versus eternity. Why? Because everlasting has a beginning but no ending. Those of you who understand Greek, uh, I know Dwight does. Those of you who understand Greek, everlasting has a point, a starting point and no end. That means every soul that has uh, been created by God in human beings has a beginning at birth, and but they go on with a, a new body or without a new body as naked, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2. The last one is personal spiritual identity. That identity is birth absolute, and it is eternal. So I'll try to cover a little of this next week when we get to the process of sonship. I hopefully we'll be able to go into some of the, the these four identities, the four basic identities, because two of those they're uh, biological and personal. Uh, we see as Curtis gave us. I forgot how many it was. Uh, I don't remember Curtis how many you said there were when he went on uh, Facebook to find out how many identities there were. There was. Uh, 200, I don't remember how many he said, 200 and something. <laughs> what did Curtis do? Oh, he is? <laughs> oh, 58? 53. 53 different identity. Huh? 58, okay. Five. Okay, 58. Thank you, brother. Amazing what this technology will do. With that said, since we took all that time on trying to get 58 identities <laughs> from Facebook, <laughs> thank you guys for joining us this week, Sunday Fellowship. I trust the Father to finish this next week with the process. We talked about the desensitization, the process of desensitization. To, to spiritual sonship. Next week, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the mystery and the process of, of the revelation of, of, uh, of uh, spiritual sonship, spiritual identity. So with that said, God bless you guys. Trust the Father. See you next week. And in the meantime, don't allow the attacks and the things Satan brings against us distract us. Remember this. I don't care how many distractions there are. You need to remember every decision you make in distraction or not, you're responsible for. God didn't let Adam get away with it. His first adopted son, he definitely not going to get let you get away with it either. You're responsible for the decisions you make and the outcomes of those decisions. The good thing about it is if you're walking in the flesh and you make those decisions and that comes back uh, what you planted will grow. Remember, if you walk in the flesh, you reap to the flesh, Paul said. If you walk in the spirit, you reap to the spirit. God provides a way of escape. So if you made a decision in your flesh and you're walking in your flesh, when that begins to bring forth fruit, if you're walking in the spirit, it will not have the same impact on you as you were if you're still in the flesh. Okay? That's just hopefully maybe we'll get some of that next week. Anyway, God bless you guys. We love you. We trust the Father to see you next week. Have a wonderful week in Christ as a son of God, spiritual son of God to your father.